Years ago, it was predicted that IP version 4 would run out of addresses long before today. The development of Network Address Translation, or NAT, has significantly prolonged the life of IP version 4. Since NAT is part of most internet gateways and routers that you have in homes and small businesses, this tutorial will look at how NAT works. In order to send information out onto the internet, everyone must have an, what's called a public IP address. If we gave a public IP address to every machine or network device in the world, we would have run out of addresses long, long ago. There are a series of addresses which are called private IP addresses, which can be used internally, but which can't appear anywhere on the internet. They're just reserved for internal use. And we're going to look at how NAT uses these, but you'll notice there's a class A range, a class B range, and a class C range. So if we have internally a lot of machines that we want to have private IP addresses, maybe we have a network that never participates in the internet, never needs to send information outside, we can use one of these uh, private IP ranges internally. So if we have a large network and need 16 million, we can use a class A. If we have a million, we could use a class B. Typically, most internet uh, routers and gateways use uh, this block here, which starts with 192.168. And we're allowed to manipulate um, these two octets here for what are called private IP addresses. Let's look at how NAT works and uses this. Here we've got a situation where we have a small business or home, and our internet service provider has put in a little internet gateway. It's uh, both a router and an access to the ISP's gateway it's going to run a service called NAT. We're going to, as we say, we're going to look at how that works. Now the ISP is connected or connects you to the internet, so somewhere in the internet there's a web server with this IP address. We're inside our small business. Now what happens when we activate NAT is that for the internal network um, your router will be configured to create uh, a range of private IP addresses. So what we've done here is we've configured our uh, little internet gateway to choose 192.168.3.0 with a mask of 24 bits. And each of the individual machines are assigned these host addresses. So this is 192.168.3.2. 192.168.3.3 and so on. So we have these four machines have private IP addresses. Let's look at what happens when um, uh, when we want to connect a client here. So we'll pick this client and let's suppose it wants to get a web page from this web server. Now the ISP has given our organization a single public IP address, but it's only given us one, even though we have several machines in here, and we could have hundreds of machines in here, sometimes thousands. Um, we only need to be given a single IP address, and this is the main key of NAT. This is how it saves chewing up all the um, public IP addresses. So how is this shared? Well, we have a client here, and it's going to ask for a web page. So its data payload says, hey, Give me a web page. And we talked before about how the IP addressing works with ports. And so we're going to assign a port. Uh, when the uh, packet gets constructed, the source port is just some random port above 1,000. We'll say it's 2,000. The destination port, however, has to be for the web server. And so this has to be since it's HTTP, it has to be port 80. 
our source IP is from here. It's 192.168.3.2. And we're sending it to our destination is our web server, 100.35.45. Dot 32. Now that packet gets sent to our little internet gateway and the very first thing it does is it translates it. It strips off the layer 4 and the layer 3 addressing and changes um, the address because this is the only public address that we're allowed to use. So the destination stays the same. We want to keep the web server as the destination. But the source has to be this address because for a return packet um, to be delivered back, it has to be delivered back to a public IP address. So this has to be 200.23.32.64. The destination port, well, we have to send this to a web server, has to be 80. But now what happens is the web, or sorry, the NAT device assigns a port number, a different port number um, to, this, uh, to this packet and it keeps track of it in a NAT table. So we have a NAT table here and, it's, and it lists all the machines that are inside its network. So we have a packet going out and it's coming from this IP address and this port and we're going to translate and change its port number to 4000. We leave this part of the packet the same and what happens now is that this packet gets delivered out into the internet and it gets delivered here. So if we look at this we can see that this web server is going to process it because the destination address is the same for the web server. It's going to strip this off. It's going to know where to send a return packet from this address and where to send the return port. So the web server, um, the layer 3 and layer 4 software in the web server strips off this. Uh, it sends this request to the web server application which then gets the page and sends a packet back. Well, what's, th what's the return packet look like? Well, this is the data for the web page. This is what's going to be displayed. The source port, well, it came from port 80. The destination port, it got from here. It says, ah, I got the request from port 4000, so I'm going to send it back to 4000. The source address is the 135. It's the web server address. And the destination, okay, well, the packet that it got came from this IP address, so it's going to send it back to that 200.2332.64. Now what the internet will do in all the routers is it will deliver that packet to our little internet gateway here because our internet gateway has this address as its own IP address. Before it can deliver it to its internal network, it needs to do another translation. So it takes the data, it strips off the layer 3 and 4, and it rebuilds it. The source, it keeps the same. It came from port 80. But now it looks in its table. It says, ah, port 4000. Looks in its NAT table and says, ah, I remember that that came from this IP address, this port. So it puts port 2000 back in here. It changes the destination address from itself to 192.168.3.2. So it fills this information in all from this port number that it had signed here. So it assigns these port numbers and then it keeps track of what port it came from and what IP address. The destination, or sorry, the source uh, IP address stays the same. That was from the web server. 
and then this packet gets put into this network. And you can see that this here is the destination address, so this will get sent to this machine. It will process it. It will see that it's destined for port 2000, and port 2000 is what this machine had linked to its web browser. And so it strips off uh, this information, sends the web page information to the browser on this machine. So network address translation um, is a way of having a single IP address be shared by literally hundreds of machines. And it's a way that we've uh, been able to save uh, IP version 4 addresses. It does it by translating the IP address and the port address uh, going out and then retranslating it coming back by keeping a table internally and keeping track of, um, of what port and what machine uh, sent the information. So it can keep track of hundreds of machines at once even though all these packets will be coming back and being delivered to different machines. Uh, each one of these machines is given a different uh, port number going out and so the NAT device keeps track of that.